I'm really excited about today. I've got a, a kind of a personal sermon that I want to share that comes out of something that um, God has been doing in me over the last, honestly, couple of years, more than two years. Um, it's very much in line with what we've been what we've been sharing, encounters with Jesus in the Gospels, where Jesus meets with people and changes them or challenges them in some really profound way. And today, what Jesus teaches solves a very deep human problem. And it's a problem that I've come face to face with um, and have had to really reckon with patiently with God's help. And it's a problem that's totally universal. So whether you're young and in school or very much not young and not in school, um, it's, a, it's one for all of us. And the story for me personally goes something like this. Jesus teaches us to be humble. We know this. It's actually one of the most important character traits that's repeated over and over in Jesus' teachings and across the whole New Testament. But at the same time, the expectation that God has for his people that we will kind of rule and reign on his earth with him. It kind of seems like these two things are in conflict somehow, that we're meant to be these very humble and lowly ones, the servants, and also the royal ones who live in his world actually as specially appointed ones with a a mission, um, and ones who actually need quite a lot of boldness and a kind of confidence, but without pride. So we've got this odd situation, don't we, where we know we need to be humble, but we actually need a lot of boldness and confidence to do what God's called us to do. And those two things feel like they're enemies. And we're going to learn today from the Gospels and and even elsewhere why... um, and especially from a particular spiritual practice, which for me has been like the, 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 what, the nail on the head, the nail in the coffin, whatever, of this problem. Um, and I'll share just a little bit about that at the end, but that's one to probably tease out more later on. We'll just uh, mention that today. But um, for me, it's all come to a head by becoming a pastor. I've kind of hit this problem really hard because... I said from the beginning, it's probably not a great way to get yourself in on an interview as the leader of a church, but I've said from the beginning, I actually don't like telling people what to do (laughs) and I don't even like telling people what to believe. I like to be as humble as I can. I like to be, um, I don't like to lord over people. I don't like bossing people around. And yet as a leader, there are certain parts of that. There are certain times in any kind of leadership, whether you're a parent a leader as a parent or a leader as a CEO or whatever, any kind of leadership, you actually do have to sometimes tell people something about what to do, (laughs) something about what to believe. And I was kind of stuck in this paradox. I have been called to lead a spiritual community and I need to stand up and take that. I need to be able to stand up straight with my shoulders back in humility. And that seems to be very hard for us to do. So I have stubbornly tried to crack this problem for a couple of years, and I'm not saying I've got the bee's knees answer to the universe or anything, but God has done something wonderful along the way. I don't want to rely on human confidence, on the worldly kind of confidence, on the kind of talk up to yourself, self-esteem kind of confidence. I think there's something better. I don't want to lead from ego, which actually, sadly, I think some Christian leaders do. They're quite convinced that they're pretty special and and brilliant and everybody should follow them because they are the special and brilliant one. I don't want that attitude. Um, So I want to lead from humility but with confidence. This is not just about me, I'm just sharing the story because actually as a matter of Christian character, this is huge. This is for every single one of us. How can we stand up straight in the world with our shoulders back and learn to rule and reign with God in His world? knowing that we're called, equipped, empowered, but with profound humility. Okay, so I want to invite you on this little journey this morning. And first we'll talk a little bit more about the problem. Then we'll talk about this encounter with Jesus in the Gospels. And then we'll just have a little look at that that practice uh, at the end that's been so massively helpful for me. And a lot of what I share today, I want to give credit where credit's due. Some of what I share today will come from a great little book, uh, pretty easy read actually, called Confident Humility 
from Dan Kent. It's, a, again, a great book, worth a full read. I'm just giving little snippets from it. Um, anybody who's really interested in this topic, it's, it's definitely worth a look. But in this book, the author had a problem. It's great. He goes back to his childhood and the, the strange experience of growing up in, um, in a Christian world with a kind of not very Christian family. And he was moving between the two worlds. And he noticed something really odd. He noticed that in church, he'd hear this message that we're all filthy sinners. It was a very sort of fire and brimstone church. We're all filthy sinners, but isn't it great that God loves us anyway? And, and the gospel, from in his experience, was all about forgiveness and that's it. And we were talking about this last week. And of course, we have to take sin seriously. If you've been in this church for a while, you know that I do. Um, our holiness is incredibly important. But that's a bad identity statement, that we're all filthy sinners. That's an I am statement that's not going to set you up for a, a very positive life. But anyway, so we heard this message in church. We're all filthy sinners, but God loves us anyway. In the world, he heard that we're all awesome, right? Because he grew up in the self-esteem movement. We probably, those of us who were around, I was around for the very end of the 80s. I was just kind of old enough to notice some stuff happening at the end of the 80s. And I remember the, the kind of pomp and madness of the 80s. It was the, the age of the Ferrari Tessarossa and the Lamborghini Countach, I think. It was No, that was 70s and 80s. 80s. It was just the, the, the decade of excess and the decade of I am awesome and will make myself more awesome. Thank you very much, right? Um, and he grew up through this time. And uh, the problem is that in the world, he was hearing that everyone was awesome, but as soon as he opened his eyes and looked around, um, people act less than awesome. People act less than awesome. In theory, in, in this worldly theory, we're all this amazing, beautiful, unique snowflake. And the universe revolves around each and every one of us, actually. don't know how that would work, but anyway. But then you actually meet a person, <laughs> right? So that whole theory comes crashing down. And the book ends up rejecting both of those. So short version of one of the big takeaways is that none of us are filthy worms. This is a really bad way to talk about our identity, especially as Christians, but I would say even for non-Christians, this is a bad way to talk about people. But none of us are the bee's knees either. So we've got, to, we've got to get our heads straight. We are complex beings. We are a mixed bag. That's a very healthy term. Each of us is a mixed bag. We're made in God's image, but we've got sin we're still dealing with. We're a work in progress. That's another really healthy phrase to use. I'm a mixed bag. I'm a work in progress but I'm moving towards Jesus, who is the perfect image of the invisible God. And as we do, exactly what Daz was describing happens in our lives. So each of the two bad options are oversimplifications. Sin is a real problem, but we are not filthy worms. Um, our image of Godness is a real beautiful truth, but we are not there yet, are we? So we have to live in the messy middle and be honest with what we are and who we are. Okay. So we get this portrait. I think this is the portrait of human nature that we get in Scripture. Because we, we begin with a royal identity, and it ends with the royal identity. We're called back up at the very end of the book of Revelation to rule and reign with God in a renewed heaven and a new earth. But along the way, boy, we, we get our royal robes very dirty very often, don't we? And we desperately need his grace. Okay, so this is where we're going. Now to set it up, it's important to get one little distinction straight. This is very important and the language can get... The, the language that we use is so important. I'll just leave it at that. But the question that we should ask to set this up is, what's the opposite of pride? Now many of us, our gut reaction will be to say that the opposite of pride is humility. That's a very easy place to land. Now, I'd suggest to set us up today that the opposite of pride, and actually basically any psychologist and clinician will tell you this, it's shame. Because both of them are sort of I am understandings and they're the opposite side of this I am understanding and they're both actually very unhealthy. One is I am awesome and one is I am a filthy rotten worm. 
And both of those are destructive mindsets. Destructive mindsets, actually. So if that image is up, we have this. Now, humility, this can be a little bit confusing because the arrows look like they're connecting them together. But the point of the arrows is that they're opposites. So pride is the opposite of shame. But humility is often its own little world. It's a whole other thing. And we're going to talk about that other thing. And it says no to that whole spectrum of pride and shame. It just says opt out. And we're going to work out why and how um, in the Gospels. So as believers, we, we easily get stuck with this same problem that the author got stuck in, but Dan got stuck in. We get stuck with a false choice. And he calls these two problems, it's a great phrase, two ditches. It's the ditch of smallness and the ditch of bigness. Very simple, right? The ditch of smallness says that nobody in life deserves a trophy, right? This is the, the stuff we were talking about. We're all scum, and sadly, even many of the, many of the very noteworthy Christian teachers in history have, have encouraged this. Martin Luther said that people are flesh, they can savour nothing but the flesh, therefore free will can avail only to sin. We are but rottenness and a worm. For all the good things you did and said, Luther, I don't agree with you there. I really don't. The charm of this team, or this ditch, sorry, the ditch of smallness, I'll use those two phrases, team smallness, ditch smallness, team bigness, ditch bigness. The charm of this is that it looks like humility. It looks impressive. It looks holy. It's a big trap. But I think it's usually a kind of false humility, partly because it's not how Jesus asks us to be or to see ourselves or to treat one another especially. But also it can easily be a way to look holy. It's like a race to the bottom, you know. I've only got two pairs of shoes and they're, they're both 40 years old. Well, I've only got one pair of shoes and it doesn't even have its toes left. You know, how humble can we be in our lives? This can be a matter of pride as well. It kind of sounds crazy, but we all know that it's true. We all know that it's true. Now, in the ditch of bigness or on team bigness, everybody deserves a trophy. Everybody gets five stars every day because we all woke up as these wonderful... Um, uniquely brilliant beings, and we just have to realise that, that we are, again, the centre of the universe. Who else is going to say that you're the best if you don't, right? You've got to talk to yourself with the most pumped up positive language you possibly can. If you can dream it, you can do it, right? That's one of the great slogans of the late 20th century. Unfortunately, Disney have, have probably enshrined that idea more than any other group. I love a lot of Disney movies. But one of the more ridiculous ideas is that anything we can dream, we can do. It's good to be positive. It's good to dream big. It's good to go after what God gives you to do. But that's just not true. It's actually nonsense. There are lots of things that we can't do as hard as we might dream and as much as we might want to. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a fun character from the last century or so in history. Has anybody ever heard the name Florence Foster Jenkins? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing a couple of nods. All right. Now, she's been brought back to the, the, uh, the awareness of, of people by the making of a movie about her several years ago. I can't remember. Meryl Streep is the main actor in the movie. And this lady, I'll just read this little bio. Florence Foster Jenkins, born in 1868 was an American socialite and an amateur soprano singer, renowned for her lack of singing talent. An heir to a wealthy family, Jenkins pursued music with passion but had little skill, a fact that she seemed blissfully unaware of. <laughs> she took singing lessons and gave many private performances for friends and high society, but it wasn't until her later years that she gained wider notoriety. Her public performances including a famously sold-out concert at Carnegie Hall in 1944, were characterised by her, by her off-key singing, her poor rhythm, and her bizarre vocal interpretations. Okay. Can we just listen to the first minute and ten seconds-ish of one of her fine performances uh, before we go any further? Okay. 
Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, very good. Thank you, Florence. The point of playing that little clip is that positive thinking and blind self-belief don't work. You can dream it as much as you want, of course, but there are some things that each of us, we're not gifted at everything. Um, overconfidence is a thing. We've just heard the sound of overconfidence. And positive thinking on its own is never enough. So we actually need to really clear our minds of some of the craft. Some of us have grown up with the positive thinking, self-esteem kind of movement because there have even been vast studies on this. And the studies have shown how unhelpful this is. It's really interesting to, to talk too much about the positive aspects of yourself. So we're not aiming at hating ourselves, not in a million years. I hope you're hearing that in my message today. But um, people who've been fed this kind of fast food diet for personal growth, that's what I would call it, where everything's about me and it's the hustle culture. You know, I'm going to get ahead. I'm going to be this great person. Studies indicate that they're people with no resilience because they're not used to the idea that actually we're not born miraculously gifted and brilliant and we, we have to work for things. Um, they are no better, measurably they are no better in performance in any measurable area of life. People who seriously engage with positive thinking materials alone. It's a delusion, actually. It's a delusion. And a little summary is... Self-esteem, now again, most of us understand this as a positive thing. Self-esteem, the word esteem is to actually think very highly of something. So self-esteem in this sense turns us into poor performing, risk-taking, self-obsessed hedonists. That's the result of study. Or basically narcissists. So we have a couple of generations of people who have grown up with this bizarre idea that we get better by just saying it. It's just silly. It's really strange. So we've got to get rid of that too. Team bigness is nonsense. But team smallness is also incredibly destructive. Now, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 23, and I think most of the solution to Christ-like hum humility is here. I turn to this chapter actually pretty often because it's it's a... Very memorable smackdown of the silliness of the Pharisees. Um, and we're going to read from, from verse 1 in this chapter. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do. For they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honour at the banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. And in an ancient culture, that would be a, a title of, of great respect and esteem, I would think, of course. Now, here's the key part for today. Jesus says, But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. He just flattens the whole community. You are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called, again, nor are you to be called instructors or teachers, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. Okay. So it's very simple, but let's read it again. You are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. You are not to be called instructors or teachers, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. So here's the situation. We know that Jesus is really tearing down the attitudes of superiority. That 
uh, that was that was present, especially in the Pharisees, this arrogance and pride, um, which comes from a very common phenomenon that just happens in all society. Visit any culture, any island, anywhere, even if they haven't haven't really been in contact with anyone. Sadly, part of our fallen nature is to set up a kind of pecking order, isn't it? We just do it. And it's hilariously dumb, but we do it. We set up a pecking order and we look around and we evaluate ourselves in distinction to others, right? And there are people above me and there are people below me. Some I call teacher and some they call me teacher. So that's what Jesus is addressing here. There's the pecking order that we're talking about. And we easily, here's where it gets very ugly and why I am so passionate about this topic. We easily evaluate other people based on where they are on that pecking order. This is not just about how we see ourselves. This is about how we interact with humans in the world. That's something that God cares about a lot, a lot. So the pecking order is one of the reasons I've wrestled so much with the position of a senior minister. Because I don't want to be on top of some dumb pecking order. I've really wrestled with that. I don't want to be, well, not in this way, right? And here's the tricky thing, is that we are called to do things and take responsibilities for things in life, and that's a different thing. Responsibility is a different thing. But it's a very spiritually dangerous place to be, to see that you are suddenly at the top of some pecking order in this just silly way. And this is just like last week when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, don't call me good, only the Father in heaven is good. Jesus is setting up a different way to think about being a human in the world and that is to have one example, one image, the image of God we've been talking about this morning. We don't look around for that, for the image of what we want to be, we look up for that. It's the only solution to the human predicament is to have something higher than us to look to to join us together. And this is the miracle of the church. It's part of what happens in communion. We commune together as equal brothers and sisters because we have something higher than ourselves. It's a wonderful, simple reality that changes everything. Now, again, we've got to think carefully because there are hierarchies, actually, in the world. And sometimes you really need that. You can't have any organised group of people without some kind of hierarchy. So it's not that hierarchies are bad. We've got to be careful with our language. Even a home will fall apart without some sense of hierarchy. Like if I were to say, well, Mirabel, Mirabel, my beautiful eight-week-old daughter, when would, you, when would you like to drink your milk? You know? When would you like to have your nappy changed? I had a very miserable daughter if I acted that way. All right? There are... There are good hierarchies, but I would say those hierarchies are about, they are about um, responsibility. There are hierarchies of responsibility. You simply take on a higher sense of responsibility and a higher actual responsibility by taking up a particular position, whether it's in the home or in the workplace or whatever. And there are actually hierarchies of competence. People can simply be more competent than other people at certain things. This is how life works. You spend 10 years... Being a stonemason, you're a better stonemason than the apprentice. And what do you do? You set up a hierarchy where the master teaches the student in that sense. In that sense. But what Jesus is smacking down here is the sense of a hierarchy of value. Any sense of a hierarchy of value in a group of people is an evil, and I would say even demonic and destructive thing. Because we are speaking to each other in a way that's less than God would speak. We are seeing each other in a way that's less than God would see. And if we tried counting the woes of history that have come from this one problem, especially men, to, to be general about it, especially men thinking that they're higher and greater, but also the damage of people thinking that they're worth less. It's a horrible problem. A horrible problem. But if you have one teacher... And you are all students. That's a humble life, isn't it? It's a humble life. So we can't look around for people who themselves seem to have all the answers. Because in this life, 
they will always disappoint. It's almost like every other week there's a celebrity, pastor or whatever, who we unfortunately invest a bit too much of our, of our enthusiasm into. And when they fall, we're just gutted. But we've basically forgotten what Jesus is teaching us here. True? Every time that happens, and it feels like the world's falling apart because some great personality has fallen, we've forgotten who the teacher is. What we need to look for instead in life is people who do a good job of just pointing us back to the one who has all the answers. We need humble pointing people. Oh, this, is, this is what I have learned from Jesus. Let me share this with you. But you know what? Go straight to the source. Drink straight from that stream. The wise person is the one who is most aware that he knows nothing compared to God. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2 says, If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Huh. That's very much another way of saying what Jesus is saying in Matthew 23. And this has been true across every wisdom tradition. It's not just inside Christianity because people stumble upon truth all over the place. Socrates said, I know that I know nothing. That's a wise statement because it keeps you in humility. And you keep seeking wisdom and knowledge. Confucius said, true wisdom is to know the extent of your ignorance. That's true. That's good. Truth always rhymes with truth. Truth is truth wherever you find it. But Jesus is the filter that we use to discern all truth. And thank God we have that, that ultimate capital T, truth. So get around people who live like lifelong students and not like teachers, and especially really enthusiastic students who are pretty happy to change their minds about things along the way and learn new things and let go of old things. And they're just getting through life, looking to the master teacher one day at a time, not too full of themselves, not trying to make their tassels longer and their phylacteries wider. Now, here's what I think we can say from all of this. And also from the simple fact that if you look across the whole New Testament... A huge amount of what's happening across the New Testament, including in all the letters, is a flattening out of society. Because the other big distinction that we have in the New Testament is the problem of Jew and Gentile getting along. And what do we hear again and again? There's no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, even male or female. Those distinctions, distinctions in this sense, in terms of value, are completely insignificant. They're real distinctions but they're completely insignificant in terms of value. The walls of separation are broken down because we have the one who stands above us all. So simple, so beautiful. We're all students. The other, the other thing we get from Scripture is that we're all brothers and sisters. We need this understanding. It's so simple. We're all adopted into the same family I'm not Uncle Matt in this, in this value sense or Grandpa Matt or the great wise one or whatever. I'm your brother. And that's why it's actually a practice of mine. A lot of, the, a lot of the messages that I send and my general communication, I use that word all the time. Hey, brother, how are you going? And I do that deliberately because I'm not Pastor Matt in this sense. I'm your brother and you're my brother and you're my sister and you get the idea. You get the idea. My best, my best performance will be to keep pointing you well to the one who is the real teacher. Okay. So it's a very simple point. But it can be really hard to practice because it's one of the most natural things in the world. And the author of this book, um, he came up with this clever little phrase. We'll just bring up the slide, that Western slide that I made. Estimating. The idea that we kind of we're always looking at each other and it happens almost instantaneously when we meet a new person. We kind of size them up. It's a horrible thing that happens, isn't it? And we'll size them up based on some really shallow things, their clothes, even sometimes their body type, their gender, whatever. We don't know anything about them. But old mate over here, he looks at the businessman who's a little bit pudgy and wearing sort of hoity-toity clothes and he might make judgments about the character of the man that are just... Completely unfair. 
No idea why he dresses that way, why his body's that way, whatever else. We can be very, very unfair. And we can evaluate. This is, I almost don't have to say the words, do I? This is just what happens. And it's the same in reverse. The businessman looks at the casual sort of cowboy get up and starts judging as well. So stop SD mating. Trash the pecking order. Bring it down. God doesn't want everybody living down the bottom, groveling like worms, but he doesn't, he doesn't want the opposite either. It's a flat world of sons and daughters. It's beautiful. A flat world of students for those who follow Jesus. So, if you have any authority in your life, which probably all of us do to some degree, but it varies a lot, it's really helpful because we can learn to humbly handle that position of responsibility as a position of responsibility, not value. And maybe even competence. You might be really good at what you do. There are many people here who have spent decades on whatever their craft is and they're really good at it. And it's fine to know you're really good at something and to pass down that knowledge. So that's not what Jesus is saying. This is about value, not about competence, not about responsibility. All right. Now, obviously, as a pastor and a senior minister, what's been so helpful for me is I've realized that it's appropriate for me to have authority and make decisions because I have that responsibility and I have that competence and I'm growing in that competence. God has entrusted me with this. The appointment of leadership is important and even good. We really need it or we can't do anything organized. Who appointed the first church leader? Anyone? Jesus. Jesus did. Peter, on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. We need leaders everywhere. We can't get anything done without getting organized and we can't get organized without having some kind of structure. So it's not what we're talking about. But I have no greater value than the least competent person in this room or the least responsible person in this room. Zero. No greater value than any of you. Again, I'm your brother and no more. And this is very important because it's a very ugly, I would say again, demonic world in which people are valued for what they can produce. Because then what happens to the members of society that are either too old or in some way unable, incapacitated, disabled? We can't think this way. It's an evil way of thinking about humanity. The incredible thing is that all of us can think about our value, and we have to be careful not to be prideful when we realize this, realizing that all of us, that the price that was paid for us was actually like an inestimable, almost, well, it was an infinite price in terms of value. The fact that Jesus laid down his life as a son of God, Messiah, for us to save us, all of us actually have high value. And we need to live in, in agreement with that and learn to be that statue that David eventually became. But without the pride that can come along with that. It's all about looking up, isn't it? Looking up for all of our learning, all of our dreaming. It's a mindset thing. So I just want to draw just to kind of consolidate some of the things that we've said. Because this is, again, this is really important self-work for all of us to do. Some statements that help us understand the difference between these ways of seeing ourselves and seeing one another. So we've got, as you can probably see, we've got Team Smallness over here. Who gets a trophy on Team Smallness? Anyone? Nobody gets a trophy. We're all rubbish in Team Smallness. Who gets, a team, who gets a trophy in team bigness? We all get a trophy. We're all the center of the world. It's wonderful. And then we have humility in column number three. So some good questions. According to team smallness, here's an identity statement. You are bad. You're bad. It's the first thing to know about yourself is that you're terrible. That's a, that's a, it's a truth that we are sinful 
and we need the transforming grace of God, but that's a bad identity statement to say that a person is essentially bad. It's an oversimplification. We're a mixed bag. We're a work in progress. We're moving towards Jesus. Team bigness, what do they say? We're all great. We're all awesome. Let's just use the word awesome. What would team humility say in realizing... What was that, Shakti? We're the same. Yeah. Yeah, one way, one way we can say that, that's absolutely right, is to realize that just like everybody else, I am just a loved and forgiven and accepted person. I'm forgiven. So we were talking about this last week. doesn't make me any better than anybody else, but I'm forgiven and loved. So that's a good identity statement. If you're going to build your life on something, because that points you to the one who's loving you and forgiving you, right? That's a good identity statement. It might sound a bit fluffy, but it's not. It's truth. The God who sits above all things forgives and loves us in every moment that we call upon him. That's a beautiful truth. Are you trustworthy? That's the next one. This is interesting. Okay. Team smallness says no. Nobody's good, so nobody's trustworthy. Everybody's rubbish, remember? Team bigness says, oh, of course, everyone's trustworthy. Everybody's great. But how naive is that? We all know that's, that's a, a very, very risky way to live life, just trusting everybody we meet. Humility, it might sound a bit negative, but I think it's just accurate. Humility says that a person's trustworthiness is unproven. We're going to give them the time. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not going to put my trust into a person until I see something about them because they're a mixed bag like me, right? They're a work in progress too. It's unproven. I'm going to lovingly go through the world with this person for a time and build trust. Trust is a thing that we build. What do we avoid on team smallness? Well, one of the things we avoid on team smallness is obviously pride. Um, And on team bigness, we desperately want to avoid shame because we'd never want to think that we're less than amazing, right? Um, Humility likes to avoid pride and shame because they're both incredibly unhelpful forces in the world, actually, in the end. You dwell on the negative in team smallness. Just about the only thing worse than just talking fluffy, positive nonsense all the time is just to talk negativity all the time. We've all got somebody like that in our lives. Um, And that's bad for everyone. Team bigness, of course, um, always dwells on the positive. We're seeing the power of this, aren't we? It's very simple. Humility, I would say, dwells on the full reality of the messy, complex world we live in. Right? It's not all bad. It's not all great. Just like I'm a bit of a mess, the world's a bit of a mess. The full reality is what we need to be aware of. So we dwell on that messy age that we live in, the beautiful gifts and blessings that God's given us, and the evils that still remain. It's a complex world we live in. And your goal for yourself, this is the last one, your goal for yourself in team smallness is deflation. If I'm a balloon, I want to be as small as I possibly can be. I want there to be no air left in the balloon so the world can see how humble I am. Anybody seeing how backwards that is? Team bigness is all about inflation. Which again, these are both size words, so they're both evaluating and comparing bigness and smallness. Humility is just aiming for fullness, whatever that means. Right? Whatever God has called me to be, however big or small I'm going to be in the world, in the world's eyes, I just want to be the full thing that God has called me to be. Is that good? Isn't that great? So this is a more uh, realistic and I think a much more healthy and godly way to think about humility. All right. So we can hold our head high, not because we're better than anyone else. We can stand up straight with our shoulders back. Because no human on this earth is worth any more or any less than me. 
And even you can take this as far as you want, and it might sound heretical, but it's not. When you read about Moses and all the, Elijah and all the greats in the Old Testament, they weren't worth any more than you either. But they sure weren't worth any less than you, right? This just flattens the whole of humanity. We were all bought at the same infinite price on the cross. All invited into one family. Not the biggest celebrity stud in the world or the richest and most educated man, not the King of England, can tell me that he's worth more than me. But if he told me that, I w- that he was worth less than me, I should hopefully pull him up and say, rubbish, rubbish. You're a child of the King too, <laughs> the real one. We all are. We all are. So the social order is a joke all the way up and down. We're just brothers and sisters. It's a terrible invention of man. And the thing we should finish with is to remember that there's a bit of a difference when we think about our relationship to God. This is all about our relationship one to each other. This is how our status in the world works, each one of us. We are lower than God. That's just reality and it's very important as a matter of humility to realize that. He is the supreme one. He is above all things. Everything has flowed from him. There's no value higher than him. How could there be? He's the infinite goodness behind all things. But before humanity, no one is higher than anyone else. This is humility in the Matthew 23 sense. No one gets to tell you you're worth more or less. No one gets to teach you. You don't get to teach them in this ultimate sense of value and status. All students, all brothers and sisters. Now, there's, there's one final piece to this which I'll just touch on, as I said, uh, rather than going deeply into it. Another great way to grow in our confidence without growing in our pride is to realize our in Christness. This is huge. It's a massive New Testament theme. I touched on it actually in the newsletter that I sent out this week. This beautiful fact that it doesn't sound beautiful when you hear the, the first few words, but we are crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. Or we can look through the middle chapters in John and we, we learn about the oneness between Jesus and the Father and the fact that he's invited us into that. We are one with Jesus and he is one with the Father, so we are completely united to him. So this is a big topic all of its own, but... By our membership with Christ, we are now in Christ. And it's like, what better identity could anybody possibly come up with but that? There's this kind of self-forgetfulness that can happen along the way when we, we realize spiritually where we live. And I think this is so profound that we are one with God through Christ. It actually takes a lot of meditation and self-work to realize it because we have so many other thoughts in our minds Some things are just too deep to read and agree with and get the gold out of. You've got to sit with them. You've got to find those passages that bring this truth to its full glory and just sit with them until it hits you. And it's been hitting me for the last six weeks or so. And it's like all my insecurities are just melting because it's not even about me anymore. I don't have to puff myself up. I'm in him. And I can say the words and it'll sound true and and they'll be nodding, but if you haven't sat with this, which I'm sure some of you have, it needs to reach full strength in your heart and in your mind. It's just the most beautiful truth in the world. So that's, for me, that's the bonus round if we really want to experience confidence without pride, realizing that actually our true spiritual address is not here, it's in Him. We end up taking our eyes off ourselves altogether. It's not about becoming anything. It's about becoming less (laughs) so that he can become more. So I hope that's been helpful today. There is a kind of relaxed confidence that has nothing to do with our human status or achievement. And we'll uh, we'll return to this because our humility in the world and before God is just such a huge topic. But we don't want to think we're just these horrible worms who are no good for anything. I hope that balance has been really helpful. Lord God, 
We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your teaching. We thank you that we have you as the great teacher. Lord, we just pray that you would help us to live as brothers and sisters, as fellow students in the world. We pray that you'll help us to look toward the master teacher stubbornly over and again, time and again, that you would be the picture of goodness that we just keep returning to day by day, that we would be happy statues, (laughs) happy statues, knowing that the great stonemason always knows best. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Amen.